Today, we would like to thank and acknowledge our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Voice Astro. DC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star Monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as APAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Please check out their webpage to learn more about their work. All right, now, without any further ado, our first of today's speakers is a graduate student at the University of Washington, where he has been doing some frankly inspiring research on the structure and evolution of massive stars for his thesis. Recently, he has been working with data from TESS, the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, bringing in machine learning techniques in order to help with the classification of massive stars, the first step in his studies. It was while working with this test data recently that he was able to make a rather significant discovery. And that discovery, ladies and gentlemen, is what he will be sharing with us today. Please give a warm welcome to Mr. Trevor Dorn Wallenstein. All right. Uh, hi, everyone. So let me go ahead and share my screen. All right, so thank you for that fantastic introduction. Uh, my name is Trevor. I'm incredibly excited uh, to be here today uh, sharing with you all uh, some really exciting results that me and my team have been finding uh, looking at evolved massive stars using data from TESS. Uh, so before I get started, I would be remiss if I did not uh, give a shout out to my collaborators uh, at the University of Washington, uh, Professor Emily Levesque and Professor Jim Davenport as well as newly minted doctor, Catherine Nugent, uh, and an undergraduate student I've been working with, Kian Gudkin. Uh, not to mention my collaborators in Europe, Dr. Brett Morris and Dr. Daniela Hoopenkoden. So why should we care about massive stars? When we look out into the universe, the majority of the stars that we see are low mass stars like our sun. So for example, uh, this galaxy here is a giant elliptical galaxy and almost all of the stars in it are low mass stars like our sun. And so you should rightfully think that we should focus our attention on these stars, understand these stars, what their structure is, how they evolve, how the planets around them evolve and try to get a handle on what's going on with them. But a very small yet not insignificant number of stars in our universe are massive. In galaxies that are forming stars like this one that I've highlighted here, a small yet uh, insignificant, not insignificant number of stars uh, have just been born and they have a tremendous impact on their surroundings. So why should we care about them? For one, these stars emit a tremendous amount of ultraviolet radiation. This uh, radiation can heat and change the structure of the material around them, injecting tremendous amounts of energy into their nearby surroundings. Throughout their entire lifetimes, massive stars also lose mass. They take material that's been freshly synthesized in their cores and eject them into their surroundings. And at the end of their lives, by definition, massive stars explode, again, injecting tremendous amounts of radiative and kinematic energy and polluting the interstellar medium with the elements that have been freshly synthesized in their core. Speaking of those elements, here I'm showing a periodic table of the elements where each element is, color is colored by the astrophysical process that's responsible for forming that element. And for almost every single element in this table, massive stars either have a hand in its formation or are the dominant channels through which it's produced. So if you care about the nitrogen in our atmosphere or the iron in our blood, you should care about how massive stars form these elements. Massive stars are also predominantly born into binary systems. 
Now, that's interesting in and of themselves if you care about binary systems, but at the ends of their lives, massive stars leave behind compact objects like black holes and neutron stars. And so these binary black hole or binary neutron star systems eventually in spiral and emit gravitational radiation, making for some truly spectacular and fantastic events that we've only just started to observe in the last five or six years. And finally, massive stars are weird. Uh, it wouldn't be a massive star talk if I didn't show a picture of Eta Carina. This is a spectacular luminous blue variable that's observable from the Southern Hemisphere. And it's strange. It burps and loses mass and goes through periods of outbursts and strange things. And, and massive stars just as a rule are kind of weird. Now, when we think about low mass stars, we have this kind of phenomenological model for how we think they should evolve. We think that they should start as main sequence stars, like our sun. They should, evolve, they should evolve and expand to become red giant stars. The most massive low mass stars go through a period of core helium burning during which uh, the star contracts and gets slightly warmer. We call this the horizontal branch. After the horizontal branch, the star becomes a red giant once again before ejecting its outer layers in a fantastic planetary nebula and leaving behind a white dwarf. Now, we can actually do better than this phenomenological model. We can develop numerical models that predict how low mass stars evolve as a function of their initial mass as well as their composition. Now we can do this because we have a wealth of observational data. So I'm showing here a uh, Hertzsprung-Russell diagram, which if you're new to HR diagrams, it shows the luminosity of a star on the y-axis as a function of its temperature on the x-axis where hot stars are on the left of this plot and cool stars are on the right. And you'll notice that towards kind of the middle of this plot, there's a lot of stars in the HR diagram. These are all stars that were observed uh, by the Hipparchos mission, which was dedicated to observing nearby stars. But you'll notice up at the top here where the massive stars live, these are the stars that I care about, there's very few stars that have been observed. And this means that our phenomenological model for how massive stars evolve is about all we have. Now we call this model the Conti scenario. It's a little bit dry, but it predicts the evolution of massive stars through various evolutionary phases as a function of their initial mass. So again, this, this kind of diagram here is a little bit boring. I'll kind of introduce this schematically. So we have in the Conti scenario, three, roughly three branches of, of stellar evolution. The first, which we think applies for stars between eight and 25 times the mass of our sun is what we call the blue to red branch. We think that stars in this branch start as blue and hot O or B stars on the main sequence before they cross the HR diagram to become red supergiants and then explode as type 2P supernovae. The next branch, and this is a very important branch for the talk that I'm about to give, uh, applies for stars between about 25 and 50 solar masses, and we call it the blue-red-blue -blue branch. Stars in this branch start as blue O main sequence stars cross the HR diagram to become cool and luminous red supergiants, but because they are so luminous and their surface gravities are so low, they're capable of losing a tremendous amount of mass and evolving bluewards across the HR diagram to become what we call a wolf A star before it explodes. The final branch of stellar evolution or of massive stellar evolution applies for the most massive, massive stars these stars stay blue. They begin their lives as O stars on the main sequence, become blue supergiants, and then encounter an eruptive period that we call the luminous blue variable phase. During this phase, the star ejects the entirety of its envelope before leaving behind a wolf A star, which then blows it up. So what's stopping us from going from this kind of phenomenological model to a more quantitative model like we have for low mass stars? Well, there's a few things. For one, for all of these stars, mass loss is incredibly important in dictating how they evolve. But our, uh, our, our measurements of mass loss rates across the HR diagram are kind of low precision. We don't have a good handle on the mechanisms and exact rates of mass loss that occur in these stars. In addition to mass loss, we're uncertain of exactly what drives 
the giant eruptions that we see from the most luminous stars and what role eruptions play in the evolution of these stars. On a related, or in a, in a related question, uh, like I said, most massive stars are born into binary systems. And the exact details of how massive stars in binary systems transfer mass and eject mass and affect each other is still uncertain. This is a little bit, uh, I guess, inside baseball, uh, but a big uncertainty in how massive stars evolve is our uncertainty in how mixing happens in their interiors. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is how do we take the elements that are freshly synthesized in their core and mix them throughout the structure of the star so they can make their way out into the interstellar medium. We also know that uh, all stars rotate and this rotation can play a significant role in their evolution. Rotation can cause enhanced mass loss. It can also affect the way that stuff gets mixed inside of the interiors of these stars. And finally, I mentioned earlier that massive stars explode by definition. It turns out that that's not quite true. And so understanding which stars explode and why is still an open question. So that's kind of all of our open questions that are, are preventing us from understanding what's happening in massive stars in general. But this talk is going to be about evolved massive stars. Now, massive stars spend about 90% of their lifetimes on the main sequence. And so you'd think, okay, massive stars are pretty rare. We should focus on the stars that we can observe the most of, the main sequence massive stars. So why, why, try, why try to pay attention to these evolved massive stars? Now, it was actually a lack of, under, of our understanding in these stars that led Kippenhahn and Weigert in their 1990 book to call them a sort of magnifying glass that reveal relentlessly the faults of calculations of earlier phases. Now, what they meant by this is that if you try to model a main sequence massive star, you can do a pretty good job. But then you take that model and you allow it to evolve into these evolved massive star evolution stages well, things go really wonky and very small changes in your assumptions can propagate into incredibly large uncertainties in our predictions. And so these stars were just kind of, we had a really hard time matching our observations to our theory. Now, I like to turn this idea on its head. I think that if you have a magnifying glass, you should use it. We can use these evolved massive stars to give us incredibly strong constraints on how massive stars evolve. Now, if it was that easy, well, this I'd be, giving, I'd be giving this talk a few decades ago, but it turns out that our magnifying glass is kind of foggy, and there's a few things that cause that. For one, observationally, these stars are incredibly rare. This means we only have small sample sizes, and so any inferences you might make on, say, how massive stars evolve or how mixing works in their interiors tend to have very large uncertainties. Theoretically, there's also a problem, and the problem is this. Like I mentioned earlier, very small changes in your assumptions of what's happening change uh, the, the kind of um, the, the outcome of how a massive star evolves. So what I'm showing here are evolutionary tracks for the same 20 solar mass star in the HR diagram, which remember is luminosity on the y-axis and temperature on the x-axis. Now, these six evolutionary tracks were calculated using six different evolutionary codes that all assume slightly different, but still physically reasonable assumptions about the physics of these stars. And for all six of these models, they all start in roughly the same place down in the bottom left of this diagram. Their trajectory along the main sequence is roughly constant, but as soon as these stars leave the main sequence, things just go wonky each evolutionary track predicts something quite different from the others, whether the star dips in luminosity or experiences this rapid rise in luminosity in its final phases, whether it turns back to become blue before becoming a red supergiant. All of these are completely different behaviors for what's effectively the same star. But it's not all hopeless. Thankfully, we're in a really exciting time for astronomy. There is a really, there's a, a number of very exciting missions that are either currently in space or will be launched soon. 
So today I'm going to be talking about data from the test mission, but there's also uh, data from what's called the Gaia mission that is really revolutionizing our understanding of stellar evolution. And hopefully in the near future, if all things go well, uh, the James Webb Space Telescope and Nancy Grace Roman Tel uh, Space Telescope are going to be launching. And they're going to be observing massive stars out to incredible distances, letting us probe how these stars evolve in a really interesting range of environments. Not only do we have this exciting space-based instrumentation, but we have some really cool instrumentation on the ground. We're rapidly approaching the era of 30 meter class telescopes. These telescopes are going to allow us to take spectra of individual massive stars, tens of megaparsecs away, which is something that is just incredibly exciting for me. On the theoretical end, there have been a number of advancements in recent years that have allowed us to explicitly treat different physical problems uh, rather than making some kind of broad brush assumptions that are now letting us tackle harder questions in massive star evolution. Now, all this means is that we can now take techniques that have been developed for our understanding of low mass stars and finally apply them to the massive star regime. And so this is kind of the subject of the work that I'm going to be presenting today, how I can use data from the test mission to peer into the insides of evolved massive stars. Now, if you're not familiar with it, the test mission is a planet hunter. It looks at the brightest stars in the night sky and looks for the tiny little dips in light that occur as planets around these stars pass between us and their host star. But I don't really care about planets. That said, it turns out if you look at a whole bunch of bright stars, well, you're gonna find some really interesting things. So before tests, there were a number of missions that did this, like Kepler and Corot, but these missions had relatively small fields of view. Because massive stars are so rare, they're very spread out on the sky. And so if you have a small field of view, like say Kepler did, you're not going to actually observe all that many massive stars. In fact, in the test field of view, there were absolutely no evolved massive stars. But thanks to the fact that TESS actually covers almost the entire night sky, we now have two-minute cadence observations for dozens of evolved massive stars, allowing us to systematically study high-frequency variability in these exciting stars. And this is what I mean when I said earlier that we can take techniques that have been developed to understand low mass stars and now apply them to evolved massive stars that are being observed in this way for the first time. Okay, so we're observing this kind of object in a new way for the first time. What do we expect to see? Well, there's a few processes that you might uh, expect to imprint themselves in the variability of these stars. For one, stellar winds might be driving rotation thanks to clumpiness in the winds. We also know that all stars rotate and so maybe hot or cool spots on the surfaces of these stars are rotating in and out of view, affecting the star's variability. You might even think that binary interactions, either via uh, ellipsoidal variability or via eclipses, might affect the light curves of these stars. But it turns out that for the stars I'm interested in, which are quite large, they're about hundreds or if not thousands of solar radii, all of these processes happen quite slowly. Now there's one other possibility for what we might see, and that's pulsations. Now, pulsations are the vibrational frequencies that are naturally excited in stars. They look something like this. So I'm showing here a model of a star that's pulsating in one specific frequency. Now, this is quite complicated. It's actually very exaggerated. The shape of this star is, is way more distorted than anything we'd actually expect to see in real life. But you might imagine that the changes in the shape and the surface temperature of this star as these pulsations travel around the star and through the star would imprint themselves onto the light curves that we're going to observe. Now, uh, how, what, what good does this do us? What can, it, what can we actually use these pulsations for? Now, as, as an example, uh, I play the drums. And so I want to kind of explain things in terms of, in terms of the drums to, to kind of help us develop an intuitive understanding of what we might see. So if I were to ask you, which of these tom-tom drums arrayed along the top of the drum set here produces the highest pitch note, you might say it's this small drum right here. And we kind of have this intuition that 
smaller things make higher pitched sounds, right? An alto sax is smaller than a baritone sax. But the exact pitch that you get out of this drum depends on a number of things. It depends on the tension of the drum heads and the hardware that's mounted onto the drums, the thickness of the drum shells, what kind of wood it's made out of. Similarly, the vibrational frequencies that we see in stars depend quite strongly on the exact details of their stellar structure. Now, how do we actually derive what frequencies we'd expect to see? It's really complicated. There's a lot of math. We start with these nasty looking equations that we call the equations of stellar structure. We solve these equations, not by hand. We have lots of computer programs that help us do it. We then take the solutions to these equations. And for every single quantity in these solutions, for example, the temperature or the pressure or the density, we perturb that quantity. We allow it to wiggle just a little bit. And we allow that wiggling to be happening at a certain frequency, frequency that we're gonna be calling omega. And we see for every single frequency, which of these frequencies give us valid solutions. Once we know which frequencies we expect to see, we then compare these frequencies to the frequencies we extract from data. And we can use that comparison to build really detailed stellar models for what's happening in the interiors of these stars. What this means is that we can make measurements of fundamental stellar parameters, like for instance, the mass. We can use this technique to measure mass. We can measure these kind of tricky mixing processes. We can even probe the interior structures of these stars, sounding out where exactly the core is in these stars or how rapidly the core rotates. And if this sounds like magic, it kind of is. But there's a number of things we can do to make it a little bit simpler and less complicated. One of them is what we call the adiabatic approximation. Now it's more math, but the idea behind the adiabatic approximation is that you can ignore some of these variables. It lets you ignore changes in the temperature or the luminosity structure of these stars and focus only on the dynamical variables like pressure and density. You might imagine it like if you were trying to model how sound bounces around a room, you would only really care about the exact pressure in the sound waves or how it's compressing the air and ignore the amount that the sound wave might heat up the air in the room because it's going to happen quite slowly and it's going to be a small effect so you can ignore it. So by making this adiabatic approximation, things get quite simple. So why do this at all? Why, why can we expect to get better measurements than just by studying a star, observing its colors or magnitude or, or uh, taking a spectrum of the star? Well, as an example, I'm going to ask you all a question. That question is, how hot is Betelgeuse? Now, Betelgeuse is this bright red star here in the shoulder of the constellation of Orion. Now, if you were to go out and look at the night sky and just based on its color, try to guesstimate the temperature of Betelgeuse, you might get it to within maybe a thousand degrees Kelvin or so. Even if you had the best telescope and the best instrumentation, thanks to our uncertainties in how we model these stars, your uncertainty in the temperature might be of order 50 degrees Kelvin, which considering these stars are about 3,500 Kelvin is about a percent or so in precision. But if you could measure the temperature of this star with the precision that we can measure the frequencies in the light curves of these stars, that would be like measuring the temperature of Betelgeuse to the nearest 10th of a Kelvin or a factor of about 100 in uh, an increase in the precision. And so that's why we care about measuring these frequencies. They give us very precise measurements about these stars. Okay, let's put that in our back pocket. I want to bring up two important pieces of context for this work. The first is what we call the red supergiant problem. Now, recall from earlier that we think that 8 to 25 solar mass stars should evolve from being O or B type main sequence stars to becoming red supergiant stars before they explode in a particular type of supernova explosion that we call type 2P supernovae. Now, we know this because we can actually look for type 2p supernovae, like we did for this supernova, supernova 2005 CS. Now, if you happen to have gotten lucky 
and observed the exact location of the supernova a few years before the supernova happened to go off, well, you can wait for the supernova to fade and try to look for stars that were there before and are no longer there after the supernova. And when we do that for type 2p supernovae, we find red supergiants. So by doing this technique, we can actually roll back the clock and observe the progenitors of supernova explosions. But there's a problem. Like I mentioned earlier, we think that stars between about 8 and 25 solar masses should become type 2p supernovae. But when we do this hunt for supernova progenitors, we find that it's only stars up to about 20 solar masses or so that actually explode as type 2p supernovae. And so this lack in our understanding of what's happening to these 20 to 25 solar mass stars is what we call the red supergiant problem. Now there's a few ways to solve the red supergiant problem. One is that, well, maybe we just need to do a better job of understanding how stars explode. Maybe these very luminous red supergiants, rather than exploding, are actually imploding and turning into black holes. Now this depends pretty strongly on exactly how you do your physics, but this is a really interesting possibility. Another, I think slightly less scientifically in interesting possibility, but still one that we need to explore is one of statistics. We know that the more massive a star gets, the more rare that star gets. It's just harder for the universe to make more and more massive stars. And so maybe we're not seeing these 20 to 25 solar mass supernova progenitors because they're quite rare. And maybe if we just observe for longer, find more supernova progenitors, we would find these luminous supernova progenitors. The final possibility, and the one that I'm going to be exploring today, is that rather than imploding or exploding as red supergiants, these luminous stars might experience very strong mass loss via their stellar winds. Now, if this is the case, we would expect this star to lose its envelope and become a much warmer yellow or blue supergiant. We call these objects post-red supergiant objects. Now, this raises the problem of how do you actually find a red supergiant object? How do you distinguish between a yellow star that's on its way to becoming a red supergiant and one that already was a red supergiant and is evolving bluewards, because this process happens on much longer timescales than we are capable of observing. One way is to actually go and look for the material that these stars have ejected. So this is what I'm showing here in what's called the runny egg nebula, which shows a yellow supergiant surrounded by a diffuse circumstellar envelope. But if we can't actually see the, super, the circumstellar envelope, either because it's too far away so we can't resolve it, or maybe it's just not there. Another option is to look for the infrared emission from the material around this star. But, well, that relies on the fact that we actually have to be able to observe this material. One other possibility that I don't have a lot of time to dig into, but is uh, it's to look at uh, the uh, pattern of elemental abundances on the surfaces of stars. It turns out that post supergiant objects may have enhancements in certain elements like nitrogen. And by looking for these enhancements, we would find kind of the smoking gun that these stars are post red supergiant objects. But that's really hard to do. You need a lot of telescope time to do. The other possibility is pulsations. And this is what I'm really excited about. So let's return to the adiabatic approximation. Now, when we run our models and assume the adiabatic approximation, it turns out that no massive stars that, are, uh, that have evolved beyond the main sequence should pulsate. We just don't find any frequencies that are excited. Now, this approximation only holds in certain cases. It holds when the ratio of the luminosity to the mass is relatively small. But if you can break this assumption, say by shedding the envelope of your star so the mass goes down and the ratio of the luminosity to the mass goes up, the adiabatic approximation might no longer hold. And if that happens, the math gets much more complicated, but maybe pulsations can be excited. So uh, there's one other piece of context that I want to discuss very quickly before I can get into my results, and that's stochastic low frequency variability. So what I'm showing here is a light curve of a star measured by Kepler on the top panel here with its periodogram on the bottom panel, 
which shows a characteristic rise in power at low frequencies, this kind of red noise that we see. Now, if you're used to looking at, say, solar-like stars, this actually might not be unfamiliar to you. This is caused in solar-like stars by granulation, by convection that's happening in the outer layers of these stars. And this kind of bubbling on the surfaces of the stars imprints itself as stochastic low frequency variability. But it turns out that this star is actually an O star. O stars don't have surface convection. They don't have granulation. So what's driving this variability? One possibility is that we're seeing what's called internal gravity waves. Basically, convection deep inside of the core of these stars is driving wiggles and perturbations through the structures of these stars that are then propagating outwards to the surface. And we see this as stochastic low frequency variability. Another option is that instead of being driven by this core convection, Stochastic low frequency variability could be driven instead by very weak convection just below the surfaces of these stars. And while this would mean that we can't use stochastic low frequency variability to probe what's happening in the core, it still tells us a lot about what's happening beneath the surface of these hot stars. Okay, let's get to it. So with my team, I studied a sample of 76 stars that I'm showing here in the HR diagram. These stars are all yellow and red supergiants, so stars that are cooler than about 10,000 degrees Kelvin. Now what I'm showing here are four periodograms uh, taken from the test data of these stars that are representative of the entire sample. What we see is that in this top star that I'm showing here, it's a pretty typical red supergiant, and it shows rising power at low frequencies, that stochastic low frequency variability that I was just talking about. The second periodogram is from a pretty typical yellow supergiant, and it shows rising power at low frequencies, this stochastic low frequency variability. And in fact, it turns out that stochastic low frequency variability is ubiquitous, not just and in uh, O and B type hot stars, but across the entire range of massive stars that we see in the HR diagram, which is an incredibly exciting discovery. Now to characterize the variability, we fit the periodograms with functions that look like this. If you care about the math, it looks a little bit like this. These functions have a typical time scale that we're going to be using to try to understand the nature of stochastic low frequency variability. Now, like I said, these stars are all cooler than about 10,000 degrees Kelvin. In fact, a lot of these stars are about the same temperature as the sun. And so it would not be a, a, a bad guess to think that maybe what we're seeing is that granulation that we see in sun-like stars just scaled up to these enormous evolved massive stars. But it turns out that if that's the case, the time scale that we derive should scale with the temperature of these stars like this. Or in other words, the points in this plot should go up and to the right. And that's the exact opposite of what we see. If anything, the points actually trend downwards. And so while we're unable to determine whether or not we're seeing internal gravity waves or subsurface convection, we can rule out this kind of solar-like granulation that we're, see uh, that we're seeing. So let's go back to these four periodograms and let's look at these bottom two. What we see is that superimposed on top of the stochastic background are what look like peaks in the periodograms, what look like frequencies that we're extracting from these light curves. So what I did was I took our best fit for the stochastic low frequency background. I normalized the periodograms by that fit to try to get rid of the stochastic background. And now I'm going to show an HR diagram. Remember that's luminosity versus temperature but I've replaced each star with its corresponding residual periodogram. And what we see looks like this. Now there's a few features that I wanna point out in this plot. One is this strip of kind of uh, orangish yellow here that I've highlighted. This is where Cepheid variables live in uh, the HR diagram. I've also highlighted this block here in goldenrod. This is an area that we call the yellow void. Basically, it's a region in which stars kind of go dynamically unstable. They do weird things and experience outbursts. 
Apart from these two kind of regions of known variability, we find two uh, groupings of stars. The first are these stars that I've highlighted in blue. Now these are all uh, A-type supergiants, and we think these are what are called alpha Cygni variables. This is an already known class of pulsating uh, B and A-type supergiants that for a while were proposed to be interesting post-red supergiant candidates. Because remember, massive stars shouldn't pulsate in this part of the HR diagram unless they might be post-red supergiant objects. But it turns out that their luminosities are a little bit too low. The luminosities are consistent with stars that are about 14 or 15 solar masses, which is below where we expect to see post-red supergiant objects. Now there's another group of stars here that I've highlighted in green. These stars are closer to 20 solar masses. And remember, 20 solar masses is that point at which stars stop exploding as red supergiants. These stars are all yellow supergiants and they pulsate with periods of about a day or faster. So we think we've found this new class of pulsating stars that we call fast yellow pulsating supergiants or FIPS for short. Now that's a really big claim that we found this new class of star that it's a, an interesting post-red supergiant object candidate. That's kind of a big claim and you should be skeptical. For one, the pixels in TESS are incredibly large, which means that we don't have good spatial resolution. There's a good chance that the light curves of these stars are actually contaminated by stars that are just nearby in the star field. Even if this contamination isn't happening, massive stars are preferentially born into binary systems. And we know that the companions of evolved massive stars like this should be B-type stars, which do pulsate. So maybe we're just seeing pulsating companions. Something that tells me that neither of these scenarios is the case, though, is how concentrated these stars are in this plot. They're all kind of bound within a small box in the HR diagram. So we can ask ourselves, statistically speaking, how likely is it that if you were to randomly contaminate five of the light curves in our sample with uh, either a pulsating uh, companion or a star that's just nearby that happens to be pulsating, how likely is it that you could just randomly select five stars that are this clumped together in this plot? Well, it turns out that by doing some careful statistical modeling, we found this to be incredibly unlikely, about a percent or slightly less likely that you would just draw these stars by chance. And so kind of motivated by this, we think we have found a genuine new class of pulsating star. So what can we do with them? Earlier in the talk, I mentioned some of the really exciting possibilities of what we can do with stellar pulsations. Well, the first order of business is actually measuring the frequencies that are in these light curves. Now, one kind of thing that hinders us in measuring these frequencies is the fact that on top of these frequencies is stochastic low frequency variability. So after doing some thinking, we actually developed a method of extracting the frequencies from these stars and measuring them quite carefully, which is exciting. Having measured these frequencies, oh, okay, it's still, it's still there, great. Um, so having measured these frequencies, we can now apply what's called a wavelet analysis. So a wavelet analysis basically allows us to measure the frequency content of a light curve as a function of time. So what I'm showing here is the light curve uh, on the top panel uh, here, shown as black points, with a rolling median shown as green, as a green line, uh, in which you can actually see the variability happening. On the right panel, I'm showing a periodogram turned on its side. And in the center panel, I'm showing the wavelet transform, where yellow corresponds to more power at a given frequency or time, and blue corresponds to less power. Now, what we see is that the band of power that's associated with this peak in the periodogram here isn't constant in amplitude. It actually comes and goes on a 91-day timescale. It turns out that this peak in the periodogram is a split frequency. It's actually split into a triplet of frequencies. And the frequency splitting corresponds to a time scale of 90 degrees. Now, what could be causing this 90-day uh, frequency and amplitude modulation? 
there's a few different possibilities. Uh, one is that maybe we're seeing uh, rotational modulation. Basically, the axis around which the star rotates is offset from the axis around which the star pulsates. And so this modulates the frequencies and amplitudes on the same period as the star's rotation period. But it turns out that for a yellow supergiant that's a few hundred solar radii, for a star that big to rotate uh, this fast at a 91 day period, it would actually be tearing itself apart. Centrifugal forces would be ripping the envelope off of the star and that's not what we see. Another possibility is that this modulation is caused by binary effects. Basically, uh, the star that we're observing is actually in a binary system with a companion. And as the companion gets closer and further away, uh, the tidal effects in the system are capable of exciting pulsations on the orbital time scale. But for a companion star of this object to be orbiting on a 91 day orbital period, in order for that companion to not be falling into the star, it would have to be a 130 solar mass black hole, which we deem incredibly unlikely. And so while we don't have um, a, a good idea of what might be causing this, we can rule out some of the more likely culprits. Now, if you're interested in this kind of like wavelet analysis, uh, I encourage you to check out on my GitHub page, a uh, Python package that I wrote that can let you do wavelet analysis, even on data that's not regularly sampled. Uh, we call the package jazz hands, like little waves or wavelets. Um, and the, the link is there. Now, I, or I, I said that uh, we don't have a good idea on what's causing this or on kind of what's happening in the interiors of these FIPS. And a big problem is that we just don't really have good models for what's happening in these stars. So I'm going to show uh, one more time uh, this uh, HR diagram measured by Hipparchos. Now FIPS kind of live, or at least the sample of stars I, I studied, live in this part of the HR diagram that I'm highlighting in red, where there are very few stars that we have observed. It turns out that this is a trend throughout astronomy. These stars are quite short-lived, relatively speaking, and so people tend to ignore them. But there's clearly a lot of really interesting physics that we can learn by studying these stars. And so this is actually where the AAVSO comes in. These stars are all bright. They're all relatively easy to see in the night sky. And so whether you're observing either by eye or with a telescope and a camera, or if you're even lucky enough to have a spectrograph, taking data of these stars is quite essential and will let us uh, have a better handle on modeling these stars, developing models for what's happening in their interiors that then allow us to predict the frequencies that we're going to extract from the test light curves. So to wrap things up, what have we learned? For one, we found that stochastic low frequency variability is ubiquitous in all massive stars. Originally, we thought it was just a feature of hot O and B stars, but it turns out to be present across the entire upper HR diagram. Now, we don't have a good idea for what's driving stochastic low frequency variability and whether or not what's driving it is the same as what's driving it in hot stars. But this is a really interesting and exciting line of research that we can maybe use to start to probe the interiors of these stars. We've also discovered a new class of pulsating supergiants uh, that we're calling fast yellow pulsating supergiants. Now, before you say anything, I know that the color yellow is not fast. I know that this is not a great acronym as far as acronyms go, uh, but we decided that it would be easier to say the word FIPS than the word FIPPIES. Uh, when referring to these stars. So we decided to take a hit as far as the uh, adjective ordering goes and call them fast yellow pulsating supergiants. Now these stars are especially interesting because their masses are all consistent with the upper limit of the, uh, the masses of stars observed to be type 2p supernova progenitors, making FIPS potential post-red supergiant candidates, giving us a really interesting insight into how stars evolve in the phases immediately before they end their lives. All right, I know that was a whole lot, so to thank you all for listening to my talk, I'm going to show a picture of my very cute dog, uh, as well as show my email, my uh, Twitter handle, and my GitHub. Uh, so if you are uh, interested in anything, please don't hesitate to reach out on any of those platforms.
All right, thank you all so much, and I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thank you very much, Mr. Dorn Wallenstein. That was excellent. Uh, looks like we've got a couple of questions which have already come in. So the first one here is from John Merle, who has asked, can you say something about massive stars that might collapse directly into black holes without a supernova explosion? Can you comment on yeah. those? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the reason why stars explode um, it's kind of tricky, but the idea is that at the end of their lives, they run out of fuel in their cores. They fuse iron and that iron just can't go anywhere. Without the, the nuclear fusion to support the gravity of the star, the core collapses. Eventually, it reaches a point at which um, a weird process called neutron degeneracy pressure occurs. Basically what happens is that core gets incredibly hard. And so the outer layers of the star fall onto that hard core, bounce, and explode. But that explosion requires a lot of energy. There's a lot of material on top of that star. And there's a few ways in which we can kind of make the star explode in our models. Uh, we can use neutrinos, which are these kind of ghost particles that we tend not to notice, but in the very dense environments of stellar cores, they can be important. Um, but it's actually kind of hard to get our models to explode. Uh, Basically what happens in these, uh, in these models that don't explode is that the core isn't quite compact enough. I believe I'm gonna be getting the wrong way around. Um, yeah, the core doesn't quite get compact enough. And so uh, the kind of outer layers of the star don't have much energy when they bounce off of the core. And so when they do that, they can't really reverse that infall and they collapse directly into black holes. Um, it turns out that this compactness of the core is really hard for us to model, uh, but when we do a very careful job, we find that it doesn't depend explicitly on the mass. So there's no you know, mass at which the compactness is enough to explode. There's kind of regimes in mass where the compactness is enough, is enough, or isn't enough. And that's what might be causing this 20 to 25 solar mass window um, that maybe for these stars, the compactness just isn't quite enough. And so the stars collapse. Very interesting, thank you. Okay, um, we have another question here from Chuck Orovec who has asked, do you have enough data to determine which of the isochrones you showed is closest to reality? So <laughs> that's a great question. Um, so like I mentioned with our, uh, with our stellar evolution models, right? really small changes can result in very different um, uh, physics. And so um, the answer is, is no, we don't really have a good idea on, on which of these stellar models are exactly the right one. Um, it's my hope that we can eventually start to use FIPS uh, to get a handle on this. Um, because like I said, these frequencies are incredibly precise. Our measurements of these frequencies are incredibly precise. And so by comparing with models, if we're completely off base, then that gives us a really tight constraint on kind of what we need to tune and tweak to get the frequencies of our models to match up with what we see in FIPS. Good answer, thank you. Okay, uh, and it looks like you've gotten our observers really fired up. We've got quite a few questions about the observational properties. So, um, First of all, do you have a list of stars that would be most important to monitor among these yellow supergiants? Do I have a list of stars? Um, off of the top of my head, no. Um, but somewhere on my computer, yes. Um, <laughs> uh, so there's a, a paper by Roberta Humphreys in 1970. Eight, I want to say, um, that kind of cataloged a lot of the bright supergiants um, in our galaxy. And that has a list of supergiants of spectral types A, F, and G. And so those are kind of the most, the most important ones. So if you're looking at uh, what targets you might be able to observe with, your, uh, with whatever materials you have on hand, uh, and you have a list of what stars are observable, you're looking for A, F, and G supergiants. Good information. Thank you. And um, when it comes to photometry, 
what kind of overall magnitudes and amplitudes would we be looking at here? Are any of them observable visually? Hmm. Uh, so for FIPS or for the, the pulsations that we're seeing, the amplitudes are pretty small. They're about a part in a thousand. Um, and for these stars, they're all in the large Magellanic cloud. And so they're all about 10th to 12th magnitude or so, um, which is a little bit faint and a little bit hard to do from the ground. Uh, but for stars in our galaxy, it gets a little bit more complicated because our estimates of their luminosity are, um, <laughs> are really bad. Um, we're really uncertain in terms of how far away the stars are and how much dust is in between us and these stars. And so our estimates of luminosity are bad, um, but they tend to be significantly brighter. And so it's a little bit easier to kind of observe that part per thousand-ish uh, variability. Um, on the other hand, uh, observing the stochastic variability in these stars is also really important. Um, so my sample was all in the Magellanic clouds. Uh, we don't really have good observations in the galaxy yet. I'm working on that. I have some preliminary results, but nothing that was ready to share today. Um, and so measuring the stochastic variability where the amplitudes do get up into a few percent or so, um, I think that is doable from the ground and especially at the frequencies that we can access from the ground. Um, those are, those are some really interesting and exciting measurements to make. All right, uh, thank you. And mm -hmm. so when it comes to spectrography of uh, these kind of stars, what kind of spectral resolution and wavelength range would we ne be needing to target? Ooh, interesting question. Um, so spectral resolution, um, Honestly, anything you have works. So at low resolution, what we can, what we really need are good flux calibrated uh, low resolution spectra that will let us do the kind of modeling to get a handle on these stars' temperatures as well as their surface gravities. Uh, at the really high resolution end of things, you know, things like resolutions of, you know, a few tens of thousands, uh, we start to get to the point where we can measure surface abundances. And by measuring these abundances, we can actually look for um, really the biggest thing we're looking for is enhancement in nitrogen at the surfaces of these stars. Basically, what happens is as uh, as these massive stars fuse uh, hydrogen into helium in their cores, as a byproduct, they make a lot of nitrogen. And if we can get the nitrogen to at least midway through the star and then get rid of the star's envelope, we can see enhancements in that nitrogen, which would be like a, a smoking gun that these stars are post-red supergiant objects. Fascinating, thank you. And uh, when you say low spectral uh, resolution, would that be like slitless grading low, like R200, 300, would that still be useful if it's flux calibrated? Yeah, that should be totally fine. Excellent, all right. Well, uh, you observers out there, get on it. <laughs> I'm gonna be. All right, it looks like that is the end of our questions for now. So thank you very much, Mr. Dornwallison. I would like to extend a huge thank you to both Mr. Dorn Wallenstein and Dr. Mutlupaktil for sharing their time and knowledge with us today. I would also like to thank again our sponsors, DC3 Dreams and Voice Astro. DC3 Dreams provides high-end observatory automation and web-based multi-user remote imaging. The AAVSO Net Observatories use DC3 Dreams ACP Expert for the Bright Star Monitors and other programs. The AAVSO Photometric All Sky Survey Project, also known as ATAS, has used ACP Expert's AI scheduler to automatically acquire over 500,000 star fields, hands off, at a rate of 1,000 square degrees per night. This has resulted in photometry for over 128 million objects in about 99% of the sky. The Boyce Research Initiative and Education Foundation provides online astronomy education, observatory resources, and research experiences to students, student teams, and schools in order to learn how to perform observations, conduct research, and publish their results in scientific journals, such as the Journal of the AAVSO. Today's webinar has been recorded, and the recording will soon be made available for free on the AAVSO's YouTube channel, where you can find a full library of webinars just like these. Go check it out. We've got a lot of good stuff there. And while you are there, consider subscribing to our channel. Not only will you get a notification every time a new educational video is posted, 
but you will be helping further the AAVSO's educational reach and making YouTube more likely to suggest our videos to others. It's just one more way that you can help support the AAVSO. Speaking of support, this webinar series is being supported by you, the viewer. So please, if you're not a member, join the AAVSO. AAVSO membership comes with a wide array of benefits, including free access to our mentorship program. So if you would like to observe some of the yellow supergiants that Mr. Dorn Wallenstein discussed for yourself, our mentors can help you get started. And as always, we would be so grateful if you would consider donating to the AAVSO. Every donation matters and goes towards making programs like this one come to life. I should mention that uh, we have a new easy way to donate, which is the QR code that is displayed on your screen right now. If you were to scan that with your phone, it would take you directly to the donation form so you don't have to look up the website. <laughs>